Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back to the CSL. I'm Joe. I'm joined here today by... Uh, I don't think it's unusual at this point. We've got Tempo with me. How you doing tonight, buddy? Yo, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, just got off work. And, you know, some CSL is on right at the right time. And you know what I'm doing after this? Packing because I'm going to Louisiana tomorrow. <laughs> or oh, tonight. That's, that's super cool. My birthplace, New Orleans. Oh, I was there a few yep. years ago for Mardi Gras. That's a lot of fun. Gonna yeah. drink some alcohol in the streets. Yo, <laughs> this is my perfect place for me to be, you know? I feel like I'll be at home. Well, neither of these teams are from Louisiana. <laughs> so, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in here. Spawning in the top left-hand corner, playing for UC San Diego. It is our green Zerg player, Light. Dun, dun, da, da, dun. And in the bottom right hand corner, he is our teal, uh, light blue, cyan, however you want to say it. It is our Protoss player representing Simon Fraser. Is it? Or is it? Uh, Simon yeah, Simon Fraser, Fraser yeah. University. Give it up for Daydreamer. I wonder who Simon Fraser was. You know, like, uh,. I don't know. I mean, he must have been a pretty cool guy if he has a college named after him, right? Like, yeah, that's like that's the crazy thing with historical people, though. It's like you go like with a lot of money, and it's like, oh yeah, he was this great businessman. He was an inventor, and mm -hmm. his favorite hobby was torturing dogs and denying women <laughs> the right to vote. And you're like, oh, and he has a school named after him. Yeah, the business like, is cool, I guess. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Or he just like inherited like a million dollars from his grandfather and wanted to have a school named after him, so <laughs> boom. It is what it is. It is but what it is. At the is. end of the day, he has a school named after him and we don't. We're casting yeah. his school. I guess he did something right because he's got a team in the uh, yep. the CS Star League. I have to imagine when you dump a bunch of money into getting a school named after you, the ultimate goal is to get a get a, Star a Starcraft, Starcraft team <laughs> named after <laughs> Get a Starcraft team repping your stride this man loved aliens he liked blinking stuff he loved stim packs robots pacific rim was his favorite movie even though he died in like 1943 but yeah after this you know i'm gonna google him i gotta find out who he was but uh what do we have here joe it is a pvz and what match is this this is in the uh round of 16. 16. so okay, one so team here playoffs. Yeah, gonna move on to a uh, round of eight. One team here will be eliminated. And this is an important one, right? Because mm -hmm. round of eight, that's like, that's a good run, I feel. Uh, oh, definitely. A lot of teams kind of squeezed into the round of 16 by kind of the skin of their teeth. But yeah. the round of eight, that's a credible run. That's putting you one away from the money, I think. Uh-huh. Uh, making you eligible for those grand finals getting up there. And we're gonna have yeah. to see which of these teams can come out on top. Uh, Daydreamer opening up perhaps with a bit of light harass at the front with this Adept gonna shade in here. Plenty of lings in place to stop anything crazy from going down. Yeah, it should be able to stop that Adept. You know, the Adept basically is there to try to scout, see what the gas mining is in the main if it can, check out the drone count at the natural, and then, you know, uh, get the hell out of there before speed is done. So the cool part about this match today is that there isn't some clear favorite in my eyes at least. Like when it comes to these uh, teams, sometimes they're gonna have one star player or two star players where, you know, he can kind of carry the team on the on his back or her back. But in this, you know, I feel like um, it could go any way, even though I'm sure maybe their records during the regular season might have been a little bit uh, different. But yeah, one thing I do want to point out is Daydreamer has made a single stalker, and uh, one hmm. of the best pieces of analysis advice I've ever gotten is. When there's a single stalker, the Protoss player is doing something cheeky. They're oh, trying yeah. to hide it. That stalker is there to deny scouting. So I'm curious because we haven't seen anything cheeky. Oh, there's the Dark Shrine. Right there in the back of the base. Yeah, <laughs> cheeky, cheeky, right? Everything all on the back corner of that base you can see. And I don't think there's any way that an Overlord would ever make it there in time unless the stalker was on the way other side and then the Overlord went around the right side or something like that. But I don't think it matters uh, to Light because he doesn't care. He's going to be going for a Roach Ling attack. We'll see if it's going to be an all-in style or if he decides to drone up the third after. But this is a really, really fast attack off of 28 drones. 
And I don't think that uh, Daydreamer knows exactly what's going on because he's kind of sticking to his guns. But I don't think it's going to matter because DTs might shut it down completely. Yeah, I was going to say, there's, there's no layer. It's not like there's an Overseer coming in here. This mm -hmm. attack is going to start. Uh, he can definitely knock down this wall, try to get some damage done. Focusing on this Adept, the shield battery going to help back things up. Actually, Corrosive Violing, his own Ravager, not a great start here. But nope. uh, he has busted into the front. The defensive DTs will come down. Can they be Corrosive? Oh! Kwame, wow. that one survives with one HP. That is crazy. Well, I mean, there is one DT. He warped in two sentries right before it. Remember now, sentries don't really do too much because Ravagers do take it out with the Corrosive Bile. Now, even though there's no detection, there's no other uh, damage being done on the other side of the map. And this one DT, I don't think it can kill every single one of these Zerg units before losing absolutely everything inside of the main and natural. Yeah, I wish we would have seen them warped somewhere like a little more defensive and they could have come in here. Uh, maybe even going for a couple at a time, but Daydreamer looks like he is falling apart in a pretty yep. decisive way here. And these Daydreamer going night night. Nearly every probe. Uh, natural base already shut down. The main is going to fall before these DTs can clean things up. Most likely, I think. And back at home, Light should just be adding on spores, making sure he doesn't die. And uh, GG is called. Wow, Light's going to be able to take it in the nick of time. Before the DTs can even make an impact at all on the game, everything goes uh, pretty much uh, the, Zerg plays, the Zerg player's way, Light. Yeah, Cheddar beating out the Provolone there. <laughs> cheese <laughs> yeah. versus Cheese uh, does look like UC takes the first map. Don't go anywhere, guys. We're going to be right back with our second map. She said, trust me, these are the stories we will tell as I stood frozen. We'll 
ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back to the CSL. We are getting ready to jump into our next game. UC San Diego leads 1-0 against Simon Fraser. Yeah, Simon Fraser, a fur trader and explorer of the Scottish ancestry who charted much of what is now the Canadian province of British Columbia. Yeah, I like to think that he invented Canada. <laughs> he basically did. How do you so, do it? <laughs> so guys, without further ado, we're gonna be jumping into our game here, spawning in the top right hand corner, playing for UC San Diego, it is Dragon God SC. And in the bottom left hand corner from Simon Fraser University, it is SC Gen X. Representing the man that invented Canada. Look at him. Literally just took it off the ground and put it on the top of the head of the US and A. Made that. Said, this is the new style. We're going to rock it from now on. Well, it does look, so. <laughs> it does look like we don't have an early pool or anything crazy coming out of uh, Dragon God, or rather uh, SC Gen X here on the other side of the map. Dragon God just getting that gateway down at the bottom of his natural ramp and uh, sending out an early probe here. Yeah, he sent it out uh, on the gateway, so he's going to get here in time to see that there's nothing out of the ordinary going on here in SC Gen X base at all, really. Pretty much uh, your typical kind of Zerg stuff. And the thing is that since he sent it on the gateway, he's not planning to go ahead and try to pylon block. Eastwatch is a pretty long map too, so I mean, uh, I don't know the time that it takes to get to the Zerg base after the pylon. And if you can get there, so uh, if you have to go a little bit earlier or not. But you know, he doesn't want to do any of that at all. But he is doing a little bit of that annoying Huck probage where he was uh, trying to mine from that mineral on the bottom right so that the drone would have to find another patch to go to, but he didn't really pursue it for that long. He ended up picking it up, and he's stealing the five minerals, Joe, and he's not giving them back. Yeah, man, I mean, when if the probe gets killed, those minerals die. You don't get to mine them. This ain't no campaign. Nah. Those minerals are just gone. So I think in the long term, that's going to be a major strategic impact to this game. It really will be, you know, like it's going to go to that point where all the bases are mined out on this huge map. And he's going to be five minerals away from making an extractor. And that's in it. In order to survive a base trade. And he's going to lose them, man. I can see the future. I'm clairvoyant. I, I just want to say if it goes that way, <laughs> I'm going uh, we'll to take, your, I'm gonna like take your advice on the, the next lottery numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Going up to a third, though, is uh, SC Gen X here. Well, at the same time, Dragon God taking that Stargate. Uh, and depending on how things go here, he might find some lightly defended drone lines to try to chip away at if his opponent's feeling a bit ambitious and greedy today. Yeah, it's very, very standard stuff coming out of uh, Dragon God. But this Overlord is going to be able to see the Stargate. He is en route, and there's not a Stalker like in the last game. It is going to be an Adept that comes out of that gateway first, and then a second one to follow it up. So no attempt at denying a scout here, aside from, well, the Phoenix coming out. So it's not going to be an Oracle. It is going to be a Phoenix, and... If there's one thing I know about Phoenix, no, I'm just kidding. But like in, in most cases, uh, the Phoenix can either be to deny this scout and then go into something really aggressive, like a, a very, very fast Twilight Council. Say it could be like a charge lot attack or something like that with an all-in with the Robo. Or you can just use it to deny the scout and keep the Zerg in the dark and go into a third base, get that Oracle right afterwards and play it the same kind of way you would if you were to do the Oracle first aside from the Zerg basically knowing that it is a Stargate. It's, um, it's a weird choice though, right? We've I feel like we've been seeing it more and more, the uh, the Phoenix first. <clears throat> and I guess you do get more guaranteed damage because they have less time to retreat the Overlords before the Phoenix can start taking control of the map. Yeah. But it does feel like you're a bit limiting yourself in terms of like what damage the Oracle can do. Because even if they don't get the scout off on the Stargate, you see a Phoenix and you know there's a Stargate and they didn't build a Stargate just to build one Oracle. Like even if they build a bunch mm -hmm. of Phoenixes or a bunch of Oracles, you're gonna get spores because that's gonna be helpful. Yeah, and it gives the Oracle less time to even have that energy regeneration too. So whether or not you're gonna use it to go across the map and try to get damage and scout, if there's some kind of an all-in or an attack, that Oracle is going to have that much less energy too. And one Phoenix usually doesn't make a difference at all in defending uh, a Zerg all-in at this stage of the game. 
But luckily for Dragon God, it is not going to be an all-in coming out of SC Gen X. He's getting the third base, getting the Roach Warren and the Evo into that lair. So it's like pretty standard stuff coming out of both players, especially with the third coming from Dragon God. He's not being aggressive at all with the Adepts. But now that he has the two Oracles and the Phoenix, he can start to get a little bit of damage done, lift up one of the Queens, uh, and then start to pick away at some of those drones. And he's looking like he wants to do that in the main here. Yeah, so here comes the Oracles. Let's see how much damage they can get done. They can get those drones down very, very fast here. Shields going off on one of them. That Spore Crawler is doing its job, but it's a defensive anchor. But a total of nine drones go down. One Oracle remains alive. That can continue to be annoying. Does want to pull that out. Doesn't want to take whole damage on it. But, yeah, uh, you already nice lost start. one of them, so. And you know what? Sometimes you'll even see the Adepts go into like the third at that point too, or the Natural in order to try to get a little bit more damage. But uh, did not opt to do that. Using them as defense is also a great way to prevent some kind of a counter attack that would have potentially come out of SE Gen X. So uh, yeah, I mean, equal workers. That's actually pretty good here for Dragon God SE. Securely taking that third base, doesn't have to worry too much about uh, anything just yet. I believe he's going to be able to catch wind of it if he keeps his oracles and his phoenixes active he needs to be able to keep checking around because he has no vision of the middle of the map he doesn't know if there's going to be an attack coming so yeah well so dragon god is poking around but behind all of this kwame he's getting immortals out two at a time and i've that... got to think this is going to be a potent timing coming out of him especially because his opponent i think is just making roaches right now yeah, he got a, a Hydra Den out, and he's not getting any upgrades for it yet, so we'll see if he goes straight into the Lurker or if he does want to go into Roach Hydra. Because I think this is, like, such a good idea from Protoss. Whenever they go for this double Immortal, they're expecting it to be Hydra Bane or some kind of Ravager or Roach-based army. And when you have that super powerful army on the ground with the Immortals uh, backing everything, they put out the damage. Even if they don't do extra damage to Hydras, they can soak damage. They do great damage versus Armored. And then you have the Psy Storm as well in order to deal with the Lings and the Banes. So if he doesn't get touched at all, he's going to have a really good economy as well as a very, very potent ground Protoss army. Yeah, so this Look at is, that. This is going up to like six Immortals with no gateway units. Right? Like... <laughs> which is, oh, boy. It's definitely funky. Um, the Warp Prism is going to be behind it, so now we're going to see the move out here. And uh, that's where all those gateway units are coming in. The gateway explosion starting up. I think Dragon God is going to go for a big attack here. Uh -oh. Although he needs to be careful of these rocks getting knocked down. He's so out of position. Yeah, SC Genex is going to be able to get some damage here. There is a shield battery, but it's looking like he wants to move back. I think the Overlord sees that. The Overseer definitely checks it out. And, and instead of going to defend, no you just got to go for it, I think. Yeah, immortals. force the recall, if anything. Yeah, I think you're right about that. You get the Immortals to come home. You can even back off. You don't have to fight them. And no. that's exactly what SC Gen X is going to do here. Uh, yeah. Buying himself time. Oh, but there was a Stasis Ward that was put there by the Oracle. Going to be able to trap some of those Roaches and Hydras and... I believe he did the right thing, SC Gen X, by forcing uh, Dragon God back because it also allows you to prepare because if you get surprised by that many Immortals, it's not going to be a good time for you, but losing all of these Roaches and Hydras is going to be pretty brutal too. That is not a cheap investment. Oh. Yeah, and they went down for free. Even the morphing in Archons kind of derping out the Roaches AI a bit there, messing with them as they try to retreat. The charge allows the Zealots to close the distance and that army is going to get cleaned up without taking a single hit of even shield damage. No, this is really scary for uh, SE Gen X because he's only on Roach Hydra. He needs to buy a bit more time to get Lurkers out. But even if you have Lurkers out, is that really going to save you? Do you have enough time to morph in all the Lurkers and have them make an impact? I don't think so, Joe. He's yeah, going to try to fight it right here. I think Dragon God may just crush through here. This army trying to kite back up the ramp. Archons trying to get on top of things here. But that is a tight choke. Uh, the Archons need to get into an effective firing position with the Immortal shelling weight from the back here. But Dragon right. God not feeling comfortable moving up that ramp. No, nah, not at all. There are too many bulky units there. Not all going to be able to participate in the battle. But with SE Gen X moving down the ramp, plus two is just finished for Dragon God. But he's losing some of his units as they are wandering a bit forward. Yeah, he Feel still like has that. He still has that Immortal core at the back. But all the gateway units up the front that recommends the buffer, all of the Archons that were giving that splash damage, they're going to be mostly wiped out. 
and suddenly the hold looking a lot more plausible here from SC Gen X. Yeah, this is impressive by SC Gen X. He was able to buy enough time. He gets the lurkers out. And yes, there are uh, observers on the map, but where is the overseer to try to snipe the observers? It doesn't look like they are there. And I think even with lurkers being there, immortals do pretty good against lurkers too if they're in this small amount. Yeah, and it looks like they're just going to crush on Fords. The third base oh. is going down. The natural also at serious risk here. Just yeah, but we have a, a drop, or at least a bit of aggression on the other side. SC Gen X getting some roaches and hydras on the other side of the map towards Dragon God's third base. 43 probes have gone down somehow. He was able to just ransack the natural in the third, but I don't know if he's going to be able to take out the actual army that's at his house. Yeah, he even cleaned out the main. This is a really great drop here from SC Gen X. If he can hang on, he's going to be in a terrific position, but that's a tall order here as these immortals continue to kite back. They get surrounded by the drones. By drones. <laughs> oh, they get saved by the War Prism, and with War Prism Micro, yeah, you think they should be able to kill infinity of these units. Zero probes remain for Dragon God, but his army value is 50. His upgrade is at plus two, while the upgrades for SE Gen X is only at plus one and not even a plus two in sight. Yeah, even the High Templar adding his auto attack in here. <laughs> <laughs> even that, yeah. Dragon God cannot afford a second High Templar to make an Archon, but every little bit of damage helps. He's contributing. One thing that's like a little bit scary is if SC Gen X can sneak his army out. Okay, that's not happening. Uh-oh, does he have any drones out on the map though? I mean, honestly, we could kind of go into a, nope, zero drones. <laughs> he made his last larva into roaches. And okay. with the recall available, it's not gonna go into a base trade scenario where there's a possibility of SC Gen X killing all of the buildings. But and that's unfortunate for him. He still has a hatchery. Oh, he does, yeah. Yeah, so, so SC Gen X, he has to defend that hatchery, but if he does, I think he wins, right? Because I mean, if he can, yeah, the army, well, I don't know if this army, two immortals, two archons, and two templar, he did not have Psy Storm, by the way. But he can't be so, bleeding out like zealots all over here. No, this he is so important. He needs to like F2 his army and get it back together, like ASAP. Oh yeah. And then he has to know that he can take this. With the War Prism though, the micro will allow him to win the fight. Kwame, so there's, I, there's four observers. Look how much of that army supply is in observers. Oh, that too, yeah. Two immortals in a, in a War Prism though, Joe. It's... it's Get ready for it. Oh, he's putting the Archons inside of the War Prism, though. Yeah, so he's it's going. Oh, but look, look, SC Gen X, is, his army's on the other side of the map here. He doesn't <laughs> want to fight it straight up. This is so crazy here, but it does look like Dragon God getting the advantage of taking this hatchery down. He can recall now, and SC Gen X, I don't think, can make any more drones. Um, he, yeah, he just lost the last of the larva. I thought uh, he would be able to do it. He should have evacuated one of the drones. I, I guess he didn't expect there to be another counterattack that quick. Because uh, as it is now, I believe that SC Gen X is in a hell of a lot of trouble. There's no way he can actually kill all of these Protoss buildings before the uh, rest of his Zerg buildings fall. And he's being revealed here, Joe. Yeah, he's being revealed. The observers uh, even showing where any hidden units might be. And the DPS is just too much from these Immortal. They kill buildings really quick. I think the so only fast. chance is like, there's three Hydras. No, GG is going to be called. Mm -hmm. Realizing that he just can't win that DPS race when it comes to the buildings. And that was that could have been pretty intense. I mean, imagine if a drone got off the, got off to the side. He had enough money for a hatchery, but had he made a drone, he would have not had enough money uh, to make it, so. All right. It's one of those things you got to take. Yeah, you got to take it, man. But <laughs> UC San Diego is going to be in a 2-0 lead. That's going to put us into match point as we get ready to go into our 2v2. Don't go anywhere, guys. We're going to be right back. And we're out.
But she said, trust me, these are the stories we will tell. As I stood frozen, infinite, I almost fell. But I got a feeling and my heart starts beating, a sudden rush of feeling alive. This is freedom and I won't change, I won't phase out. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Match Point here in the CSL. This is the round of 16, Simon Fraser University on the ropes of elimination here. As we uh -oh. get into our 2v2 match. Yep, it's going to be a 2v2, a Zerg and Zerg versus a Zerg and Terran on everybody's favorite, favorite macro map. Um, heavy macro. Very, very heavy macro. I, I would assume at least a three hatch before pull from both. These two players spawning in the bottom left hand. In the left hand, so I don't confuse you, it is uh, representing University of San Diego, University of California, San Diego, Cloak and Light. Or as we like to say, Licked. 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 And their opponents in the top right hand corner, it is the Blue Terran Lingasing. And his teammate, the Red Zerg player, Minga. Did you know that Simon Fraser died at age 86? He had nine children also. Nine children. One of them 86 died 86 is infancy. pretty, like that's good. 86 uh, in 1862? Like wow. That's solid, yeah. What a god. <laughs> Damn. What do you think he ate to stay alive that long in 1862? <laughs> oh, uh. I bet it's like deer and raccoon, right? That's probably what they ate. Straight up moose. Antlers. Like I think he just chewed on moose antlers and swallowed them whole. That makes a lot of sense. Because nobody does that. And, um... You, you know, know what else nobody does? <laughs> Makes <laughs> two pools this early. <laughs> Yo. Actually, that's what both of them do. Shrines of Lizzle, though, right? You gotta make the pools real early. Mm -hmm. Like, that yeah, could be, well, like, a safe defensive time. <laughs> yeah, no. Surprisingly enough, uh, you're absolutely right. Cloak and Light are taking it uh, in the defensive way. 
or at least in the way that allows you to do aggression, but it's not like a complete cheese. While Ming A is gonna be going for a super fast. I didn't see if it was a 13, 12 or not, but. Well, with this bailing is... nest, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just how timings work out for you to get the gas that way. Yeah, I think I think it was um it was later than a 13, 12, but he didn't take a hatchery with it. Because if you look even, well, here come the lings already. They are earlier than those of Cloak. Yeah, they, uh, and did his teammate. Go, they did go pool first, so they're gonna have lings, like, eventually. Mm -hmm. But I think this is the right move when you're playing against a team that's probably favored, in you, uh, favored over you in terms of raw skill here. Yeah, but they have to get damage done because if uh, this early pool from Cloak and uh, Light... If it's this early and it defends this uh, easily... Then remember, the economy of Minga is not going to be that good at all. So he needs to wait. Yep, the Reaper coming in to assist. And yeah. even Light with his Lings trying to help out. I like that hold position, Micro. Is it going to uh, come into effect? Minga does get a good surround here, but the, the uh, Link count, rather, of Minga is just absolutely plummeting here. The drones are fighting in full force, and all those Lings of Minga are cleaned up. There's a couple Reapers left behind here, and they're going to try to get some damage in, but they might need to go uh, jump off the cliff and do some drugs. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard that. <laughs> That's, they're called combat drugs, right? That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but when you frame it that way, it makes it sound so funny. Well, yeah, that's a nice defense. Uh, and light, yeah, with the defense, I think he went for the Baneling Nest first. So he's going to be able to get Banelings out. But here come the Banes of Ming, eh? He's going to explode one of them on the Queen as it did assist in the DPS. And the Banes do nothing. Yeah, I would have loved to see those Banes turn around and try to pursue the uh, Lings of Light because they're slow Lings and you're like kind of battling over like creepish areas. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could have caught something. But when you're walking into Ling uh, Queens with just two slow Lings, or it's two not going to help. Yeah, it's not going to work gonna out. Good. Although they might get a lot done on Light's side of the map here. This Reaper count is quite high. Drones being evacuated here. There are Bane Lings, but those can be targeted down quite easily, especially with the bombs to buy time and buffer. Yo, you're absolutely right. The, uh, the Reaper count is starting to get a bit scary, and he's not stopping. He's making three Reapers at a time, and he's also starting to expand. So Light is actually losing almost everything. I cannot believe it, Joe. He's down to five drones. And even though it looked really bad in the beginning, I think it's actually starting to uh, work out. Yeah, Lingazing showing off his stuff, being the anchor man here. And those two Banelings suddenly, with all of these Reapers helping, become a lot scarier. Wow. Simon Fraser, they could put one on the board here. Remember, Cloak is still at about 27 supply. And uh, his speed has completed, but can he actually contest the Banelings? I don't think so. This is such a cool dynamic. The Reapers being able to bully all of the Lings, and then the Banelings being able to add to this KD8 charge as yeah, some well, kind of a, a safety measure. So they've got, they've just got to come up here, and the Queens are actually gone. So these Banelings have an open shot to the drone line if that's what they decide they want to do. I think Simon Fraser about to finally put one on the board here, potentially start to turn this series around thanks to some really cool play out of Minga and Linga Zing. Yeah, this is great for them. They are bringing it back, and even more Lings coming from Minga. This is going to be it if the Reapers do not get dealt with. And I don't think they're going to be dealt with, Joe. We're going to be going to the next game as Simon Fraser University puts one on the board. Not going to go down without a fight. Just like the real Simon Fraser dying at 86. <laughs> he put up a great fight. <laughs> I imagine he's looking down from wherever he is now. Right now. He's proud. Smiling upon these plucky, scrappy StarCraft players that have put one eye. on the board. Those managed my boys. to start to turn things around. <laughs> I mean, keep in mind, guys, who knows what the next match could bring. And if they bring this out, they get to revive someone for the ace match. This is an incredibly close series. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back with the next 1v1.
But she said, trust me, these are the stories we will tell as I stood frozen, infinite, I almost fell, but I got a feeling in my heart starts beating a sudden rush of feeling alive, this is freedom and I won't change, I won't What's up guys we are coming back it's another match point here in the csl round of 16 between uc san diego and simon fraser university yeah it is going to be that match point still but simon fraser is showing that they still have life in them not going to go down uh three to zero and here we are on neon violet square it is going to be a tvp between combat wombat Probably my favorite name in all of CSL. You know, it could be in all of StarCraft, but uh, at least for yeah, now. What if my he favorite was like name super that I've good? Like, could you imagine like Artosis saying that name and not like not dying? <laughs> dying. He would have like that. Yeah, the famous Artosis laugh Artosis when Tazla says something that just triggers. You know, Artosis like he has like a trigger. It doesn't have to be even that funny. It's like Tazla's, <laughs> Tazla's like, hey, do you remember Lunchables? And Artosis just <laughs> dies. <laughs> Lunchables, they so did funny. exist, tasteless. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know? Uh, I love it, though. I, it's no, contagious, it's so too. Good. I, it's so I started good. dying, too, because of it. Oh, Well, snap. and that's going to be a quick GG. It does look like uh, UC Simon? San Diego takes the game. Uh, in all seriousness, we did have a disconnect, guys. Mm -hmm. so. Gives me time to go back to Game Heart. Because I forgot. <laughs> Maybe we had the wrong map set up? I don't know. It says Neon Violet Square here on the sheet that I was given. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it was so quick. It was literally as soon as we loaded into the game. Yeah, my, I but... think there was some kind of DC. We're going to be right back when we figure out what happened, guys. Don't go yeah. anywhere. Still match point. Yes. 
ladies and gentlemen, we are getting ready, hopefully for the last time tonight, to try to go into this specific game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've tried this a couple is, times. Uh, take three here. One of them was my fault. One of them was not. But uh, we won't say any names. We ain't snitching. <laughs> yeah, man, snitches get stitches. Yeah. Unless it's oh, like bad, man. like snitching on murder. But what if, what if you cool. need stitches though, right? Like, what if you really get injured badly and you, you, <laughs> you know, got, like you a got a huge snitch. gash on the side of your head? You're like, yo, got man, I better snitch. go snitch. So <laughs> real quick. <laughs> All right. Well, we are getting ready to spawn into this game here. Uh, gonna be between. UC San Diego and Simon Fraser. So without further ado, let's hop into Neon Violet Square and spawning in the top left-hand corner. It is our green Terran player for Simon Fraser. Combat Wombat, hoping to do Canada proud. Indeed. And in the bottom right-hand corner, it is our red Protoss player representing University of San Diego. Give it up for your boy, Flume. Playing for Psionic Aftermath as well. One of probably the better NA clans. Yeah, they've uh, been uh, a bit more active, right? Like you see them quite a bit, all different levels, but uh, I would say I think them, a lot of them are like master. Yeah, they've got the GMs, they've got the masters. I think they have guitar cheese still. Yep. They're like one of those clans that, you know, you put on the same level as like, uh, kind of like below like a rise or like a, like a sloth B team. But still, like, strong. You know, they're going to take game. They're going to beat teams in clan wars that are better than them. So when you see a player on that, especially in a league like the CSL, you have to respect that. And Combat yeah. Wombat respects it because he is proxying a barracks. Ready for combat. Yep. And it's only going to be one barracks. So maybe he is a bit inspired by Euthermal here. As uh, earlier in Asian Wars, Euthermal did a proxy build against Neeb. And he wanted Neeb to know that it was a proxy and then he was going to go into something else. In order, you know, he wants the Protoss to at least overreact to it. But I think Flume, yeah, with that scout, not seeing a barracks at the top of that ram definitely uh, makes some alarm bells. Oh, okay. It's not even just going to be the barracks. He's going to proxy the factory too. Yeah, with so the reactor coming here on the barracks. You think the reactor is going to be for the barracks or do you think it's going to get swapped to something? I don't know if you can afford double cyclone, but if he goes for like a cyclone, I would assume that's what the reactor would be for. But we're gonna find out very shortly. As yeah, with double Flume gas, I think that, that might be what it's for. Just yep. not revealing it. That's always a good thing to do, right? Like you don't want them to know that you know. Yeah, it's kind of a weird thing because you have to make the read. Like, can you shut down the creation of the factory? Because if you can then combat wombat's gonna be a very sad boy but oh I, yeah i guess it's kind of like it's it's the guaranteed damage versus the high risk high reward type of strategy and you know flume clearly feels comfortable he just pulled back without revealing that scout there are going to be double cyclones incoming this stalker might get caught in a super awkward position if he goes out to try to poke at this factory yeah that's what i was afraid of right he sees the reactor there he's trying to poke at it and yeah, I guess he can try to ch chip away, but he's getting a little bit too close. And the Cyclone, wow, it takes out the shield so fast. And yeah. he needs to be so careful because Cyclones are not nothing to be messed with. Well, so the, the Zealot here is actually an absolutely terrific buffer. He can't ignore it. He has to deal with it. But there's two shield batteries, and that's a lot of defensive firepower. Yeah, this is important that he didn't uh, actually commit too hard to it. I guess he is going to continue to make more Cyclones. But uh, Flume did not get his base, right? So he ended up not going for his base. And that means he wants to commit to this defense. He does not want to die to the Cyclones. Investing in those shield batteries, that's nearly the price of a Nexus. It's about 100 less. What, wait, what's happening? Why are these Cyclones... What? Oh. He kind of like gave up but didn't because he went back with one of the Cyclones. That was super weird. He was equal on Cyclones, or would have been after that production cycle, as the stalkers of his opponent. And that's like a nice spot to be in. But mm -hmm. he gave away two Cyclones for free and just kind of sat in the middle of the map with his other two. I think Combat Wombat in a lot of trouble all of a sudden. Can his cool name pull him out of this situation? <laughs> well, one of these Cyclones are very low. The shield battery is still at nearly full energy. And with that Cyclone getting taken out, yep. I think with the shield battery micro, this Cyclone is not long in this world. And I would say that the rush has failed. Simon Fraser in a bit of trouble, but 
he does have at least the base coming up, and he's denied the Nexus for so long. Yeah, he's actually. Uh, but I think he would want to get more damage done. That was a weird opener. I think Combat Wombat definitely behind. Yes, but very. Like, it does feel like Flume maybe was hyper safe, and because of that, Combat Wombat kind of is like more in this than he has really any right to be at this point in the game. Yeah, well, how many? Uh, he lost three Cyclones and only was able to get one Stalker. So I don't think that he's like behind behind in the sense of, okay, he has no workers, but I just don't think he's going to be able to deal with the Stalkers. There's no bunker at the front. And with no Cyclones to even help here, this is just not going to work out for him. Combat Wombat. I think those are his only units. Remember, he flew everything uh, back, made a tech lab, and then started producing units. So now he's going to have to at least forfeit an economic advantage that he potentially could have had with mules. Losing Ooh, five of the workers. This but a cloak Banshee could have something a to do. Lot more uh, dangerous, though. Yes, it does. Where is that Banshee, though? Is it going is across it the going map? to the other side? I think so. But he needs defenses at home here, Joe. Yeah, it is going across the map. It can do a lot of damage, but he's got to find a way to survive as Flume walks up this ramp here. Only a Marauder, a Medivac, and a Marine trying to hold it down back at home. This Banshee's starting to get into the mineral line to do some damage. <clears throat> but that first observer's on the way, and we're going to see probably like two Stalkers warped in at home. And there's just nothing to deal with these five Stalkers. Every single unit comes off the line here to try to deal with this, but they can actually even jump up into that warp prism. Yeah, some pseudo blink micro coming out here from Flume. Gonna be able to save the stalkers ever. Wow, they're getting so low and he just picks them up and then puts them on back. Did he lose a stalker there or? I don't even know, but they are like, that is how you do it right there. Getting maximum damage done. And with the siege tank coming out, he could one shot it and he's gonna go for it, but he's gonna take some damage. And these are pretty low stalkers. Only the top stalker takes damage. And down goes the Seas Tank, Joe, as well as the chances of Simon Fraser being able to clutch this one out. Oh no, 61 supply, 222. I think the Banshee is dead. Yeah, we can confirm. We're getting reports in that the Banshee's dead. And I think that's just it. Yeah, this could be it. A Liberator's really not gonna help there because you can outmaneuver the uh, Liberation Zone. I guess the only thing going for him is that he does have like a pretty high energy command center, but yeah, if you even look at the worker count now, Flume is making a lot happen with very few units here. Yeah, Flume has 40 workers back at home, which is super important to keep in mind here. This might be a cleanup if the tank can find a good SimCity position, but it's actually just going to fight in the open here. I mean, you can't blame Combat Wombat for white-knuckling on to every inch of his life in this tournament. He wants his team to win. He wants to make it into the money that you find in that round of eight. And Absolutely. But being down to ten workers here, Joe, the Liberator having to reposition over and over again. I believe uh, the Command Center is starting to blow up as well, and that is all she wrote. Yeah, GG. Taking a game, closing out the series for UC San Diego. And that was a terrific match. A lot of those matches were really hard fought. Big congrats to UC San Diego for making it to that round of eight. Yeah, really solid play too by all of their players, right? Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, that first all in was like pretty perfect. And the second game was pretty cool, too. It kind of got down to the wire with both players being down to zero workers, but they were able to bring it uh, to that two to zero lead. But then the 2v2 team for Simon Fraser with with the micro, uh, just the synergy between their two units that they were making was Lings and Reapers versus uh, basically Ling Ling. <laughs> yeah. Mingling Ming -ling didn't make a single Ling because he was a tyrant. <laughs> well... Well done once again to UC San Diego. Thank you everyone for watching. Be sure to use the command Discord if you want to get into that Discord server. Thank you Twitch for helping to make the CSL possible. And we will see you guys next Tuesday. Uh, I believe for the round of eight to kick things off. Uh, so make sure you catch that. And we will be back then. Indeed. Y'all have a great night everybody. And we'll see you next time.